Welcome to Roll Call, the number one Birmingham Roller podcast, bringing together Birmingham Roller fans from all over the world. everybody welcome to another show the roll call podcast um i believe this is the 27th episode here um if everybody could could hear me good could see me good put a thumbs up on the on the chat um so as, as you guys know i'm your host uh, jerry chicone unfortunately ray couldn't be with us today i told him we had the we're gonna take today off and unfortunately like i i I got a, a call from Mr. Richard Apodaca, and we decided to go on live. So, uh, so today I'm gonna be hosting it by myself. But uh, today, uh, today's guests, we got um, old schooler, old timer, a veteran in a hobby, Mr. Richard Apodaca. Richard, how you doing? Okay, how you doing? Good, good, good. So, uh, <clears throat> thank you for joining us here today. I, I really appreciate you. Um, it was a My last pleasure. minute, last minute thing. You called, you called me yesterday, and and um, I asked you to be in a show, and and uh, you you're all in. So thank you so much. Thank you. And like I said, I was just calling for fellowship, but uh, but in the rollers, uh, well, like I had talked to you before when I was studying guitar, and I would go from teacher to teacher and. And everybody said, do it like this, but nobody really understood. And it took me many years to find how music really worked. And the birds, the same, but I didn't really ever find that person. I had to figure it out myself. And uh, I started off with some birds from Homer Coderre. And uh, I had instant fame because I took one of his cockbirds and a bird from a feed store, put them together, and all of a sudden they were the Black Badge family. And uh, people like Cornell Norwood were coming over and, and uh, wanting to see these birds. And uh, it was just a lucky mating. And I didn't know where to take it from there. They, they rolled deep. Uh, the, the youngsters rolled real nice, but not a whole bunch of speed. Then later I took a Paul Platt's uh, cock bird, a jackanet bird, and mated it within that family. And all of a sudden I started getting speed. And the bird that I got from Paul Platt's was a muscular bird. So I started thinking, I wonder if the muscle has something to do with it. So nobody could answer that. So I started going on that pretense and, and uh, I started trying the muscle hands on a regular cock and the muscle cocks on, on a regular hen and bingo, nice. it was the cock bird. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so then from there on, I just, kept evolving from that using that same theory nice. and once i once i moved to west covina and if if uh if you want to talk you just let me know brother no <laughs> but, i like i like i like for you to give us a little history of of you okay. know with, with the old timers with homer coder cornell and give us a little insight of all that um i know that you're talking about even 
beyond that when when by homer knowing pensum and stuff like that so this this is something that it's it's not in the, in the books and we we we, we all want to know you know so go go ahead okay well i met homer and homer was a wonderful wonderful man and <clears throat> homer didn't have a whole r bunch of rhyme or reason for his matings he could just pick up two birds and the families didn't matter. He didn't care about that, what they went back to. And, and he would know instantly. And I've never seen anybody like that since. And he couldn't really explain to me what he was doing uh, just because of that. He just had a feel, a natural feel for the birds. And I took him over to Dave Sanchez's house because I had just met Dave. And uh, so I, I took Homer over there and, and introduced him to Dave Sanchez. And, uh, and then I started meeting, you know, a lot of people, different people over at Homer's house. And uh, Homer gave me a black ball head cock and I made it to a, to a black hen that was similar in in uh, in the in the color and the pattern, and people start calling them the Black Badge family. They spun real deep, not a lot of velocity, but all over the neighborhoods now. People people were coming to see them, and uh, and as time went by, like I I I just repeated myself a little bit. But when I did cross that Paul Platt's cock in there, I realized what was happening. And then I started experimenting with it and getting birds from different places. And I ended up getting a, a black, it was, it was like a kite type bird with bronze all over the wings. And uh, I'm not sure where it came from originally but I got it through a friend of mine named Jeff Seitz. And I started incorporating that into the line and it brought in more velocity. Again, it was a husky bird. And uh, so as time went on, I started getting other birds from Homer and from a few other places, not many other places though. I kind of hung around with Homer. He was my bud, and, and, and he and, was still working at that time. And 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 for those that that um, don't know who Homer is, uh, I mean, he goes way back, way back. And 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 could you give us a little um, knowledge on who he was? And and so those that don't know who you're talking about, be well, be Homer before you was... go further on, that is sorry about that. Yeah, he was just uh, one of the old timers, and uh, I forget what state he came from, but when I met him, he lived in West Covina, and Bill Pensum used to go over to Homer's house, and one day Homer said, uh, and he had some article, uh, the article said that uh, that the the guy was at Homer's house and he said, I see more action here than sometimes I see over at Bill's. And uh, so Bill Pensum got mad at Homer and Homer said, uh, I didn't ask him to say that. I don't know why he said that. And anyway, then, uh, so Homer had a history with Bill Pensum, but I met um, Cornell Norwood, yes, and uh, also norm reed and norm told me he said i never saw great kid action at homer's but i saw birds with velocity that i could not duplicate so i went on with this muscle cock theory and i started spending four to five hours in my breeding loft and uh i got uh, different families, and a lot of them were, were going back to Homer. Then Homer went out of birds, and everybody went flocking to his house. 
And a week later, Homer called me and he said, Richard, how come you didn't come to my house? And I said, I'm not a vulture, a scavenger, Homer. I said, you know, I didn't want to come running over there. And he said, well, I saved my two best pair for you. Come and get them. So I did that, and he gave me some uh, red spangles, and they went back to Cornell. They were five four, uh, from the 514 family. And I, I used them very effectively, and I got a grizzle pair from him too. And grizzles are hard to work with. I don't know if you've ever worked with them. You made anything to a grizzle, and the youngsters are all grizzles. Even if they're not showing it, they carry the grizzle factor. And you get too much grizzle, and they're really hard to manage in the air if you get too much white on the birds. So anyway, eventually, I created a large uh, family of birds, and I call them my pit bulls. And it's because a gentleman came in the cage one time and he said, my God, those birds look like pit bulls. They had these big necks. And uh, so then I took them and I took the cockbirds again. The cockbirds were the ones that did everything for me. I mated them to a smaller hen and then I got medium-sized birds. Okay, well, the medium-sized birds were my breeders to make flyers. Wow. So I ended up with three different families, the big ones, the medium-sized birds, and the kit birds. So I would take the medium, a medium-sized cock and I would mate it to a smaller hen and I created my kit birds. I did not stock from the kit. If I saw something exceptional in the kit, I went right back to the breeder loft and tried to figure out, well, I knew because records, who made this bird. So I would think about developing more of the parents uh equals so it'll, you know, be, it'll, be, it'll be more more of the muscle cock that that, that produced that that the the, the yeah. parent yeah but but even even more important than that i would i would look at the parents and i would check the records and find out exactly where that cock came from what pair made that cock what pair made that hen and so i made more pairs like them and they started uh, giving me birds that were that were equal to what I was seeing in the kit. And so I realized that the true value is in the breeders, not the kit birds. Kit birds, you can have something that's doing great, and it may not throw it at all. So it's kind of a shot in the dark. But this other way worked real good. And uh, that's really what I wanted to share with people. And I've done that on videos and I've tried to tell people, you know, I'm not here to make money. I'm just trying to help others. And, and, uh, and people took the muscle cock theory and they say, these birds are bred down from my muscle cock. But I had a muscle cock in every single mating. And that's how I uh, kept getting the high velocity in the birds. Nice. So, so, so your muscle cock would pretty much be a, a, a just a, a bigger bird than what 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 you would think. But it won't ne it won't necessarily be the bird you want to fly. It would just be the bird That's that you're correct. looking for as for the breeding uh, program, right. right? A lot of strength in it. A lot of strength in that cock bird. I did breed the other way too. I would create muscle hands and put them on the smaller cocks, but that didn't work uh, as consistent as the other way. So the larger muscle cock uh, gave me uh, a lot, a lot better birds, more consistent. If if you if you had to to 
try to produce more muscle cocks, which way would you go? Like, what what would you do? Let's just say, if you're running short of muscle cocks, what would be the best way to produce another muscle cock? Well, I had muscle cocks from different families, okay? And uh, ideally, you hang on to the parents. You know, and how will, how would the parents look like? Would would they be a uh, bigger size? Would it be a bigger bird, a bigger hen, be, a bigger cock to produce well, that I, muscle cock or hen? Yeah, I really used. I would always use the cock bird, and then I would pick the hen, and and just figuring if I mate this big bird to the smaller hen, and not too small because I want medium sized birds uh, to breed to breed with. Uh, so I would have different families, different uh, matings in the cage. See, years ago, when I was first starting, I lived in West Covina, and uh, I put this this pair together, and the and the birds came out really, really good. I said West Covina; it was Moreno Valley, but uh, so. I thought, well, I got the birds in the air, they're doing great, so I took the parents to the feed store. And later, I realized I couldn't duplicate what they were. And so I realized I needed the parents. So I ran to the feed store, and of course, somebody had already snagged them. So, but it taught me a lesson. So, uh, I had a friend of mine recently that said, Richard, I've got some really good kit birds that came out. They're better than all my other kit birds. And so I'm going to breed with them. And I told him, do you still have the parents? And he said, yes. And I said, do you have the birds that made the parents? And he said, yes. I said, make more of the breeders. And then you'll get better kit birds that are equal, hopefully. Right. And so he did that, and that started working for him. Would would you ever produce a muscle cocks out of the muscle cock and its smaller pair? Did you ever I have would luck? produce strength, yes, yes. Uh, from the big birds to the medium birds, I would keep, I would, my goal was to keep the muscle on the cocks. Nice. Yes. Um, I want to I want to thank uh, it's somebody left a questionnaire on the last uh, on the last episode we had. And I I've, I've, I've found it being re- very good uh, to use on the podcast. I want to say thank you. So we're going to go ahead and use that today. So, um, sure. you know, I want to say thank you. And, and the first question was was how do you select and breed roller pigeons with the desired traits for competition success? So that, that's, that's pretty much what we, you're, you're at right now. Um, do you, you know, I've seen a lot of your videos that you got out yeah. there on your, on YouTube. And those of you that haven't go on there and, 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 and search, uh, Richard Apodaca roller pigeons and they'll start popping out. He has about two or three of them on there. Uh, Sam Smitty, uh, uh Richard Reyes, uh, J- JV, uh, 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 JV Vander, Vanderbrock, uh, has one too. So just, just tune into that. He talks a lot about it. And then there's also pigeons where, which, which he shows as a sample of what he's talking about. But, um, on one of them, you're, you, you talk about, um, that a lot of, a lot of people have that theory of, keeping it simple, select best to best from the air. And you say that that could be a way that you could, could deteriorate the role of the pigeon in several generations. Could you explain to us what you meant by that? Well, um, when you select from the air, you have something that is, that is really lightning fast, it's a result of the of the parents. You did a good mating, and so you made that lightning fast bird. But there's no guarantee that that bird will produce anything for you. Uh, you may 
produce birds that don't even roll at all or are very seldom. Or, uh, and one thing I learned breeding the birds too, if you breed families that are inbred, a lot of times, say somebody has birds that don't kid, or they have different different faults in them, and, and the people, we all try to get rid of these faults. So we try to breed the faults out of the birds and clean up our stock. But those become the creatures that live within, and, uh, and they'll pop out later. But... Uh, yeah, to, to me, the parents are what matter. If you uh, did your homework on the parents and they bred you quality birds, uh, then you want to stay within your, your loft and really think about how to make the breeders and not really pull birds out of the kit. Nice, nice. Um, so... The next question would be, uh, can you share any tips for maintaining the health and condition of your roller pigeons during training and competition? Whether you, you compete, well, not necessarily got to be a competition, but the day that I would say well, you peaked them out for the show that you want to show, you know what I mean, that you want to deliver, whether you have people in your yard, whatever, but that day, what, what? Could you explain to us and share with us tips for ma maintaining the health and condition of your roller pigeons? Okay, well, I was not a competitor, okay? And, and maybe that's why I had extra time to really develop my stock the way that I wanted it. I developed my stock for me and I spent five hours a day in the in the cage, uh, reevaluating my matings and stuff like that. Uh, I shared with my friends, and uh, Norm Reed was one of them. Norm Reed, uh, he got some of the red spangles uh, from the pair that I bred from Homer, and then I took those red spangles, and I started working on that family, and trying to get them to where they threw more velocity and it was working and norm came and he said i want another cockbird and he says have you been working on them and i said yes so i gave him a cockbird but i wasn't quite finished with them yet and uh, but they turned out to be so so good and um i got uh, a hand from john vanderbrock and, uh, and I made it that into my family. And uh, his birds are, they were inbred and uh, the character was a little nervous, but, uh, but as I crossed them in, he did a great job with his birds. And, uh, and I was able to use them effectively on, on some of the muscle cocks. Nice. And, and and as far as the health the health and condition to get that performance um anything that you you do prior nothing, to yeah nothing extraordinary i lived in the country and where i lived there were rattlesnakes gopher snakes a lot of rattlesnakes uh, uh there were rats and mice and and varmints that would come into the cage sometimes and and uh, the rats would eat through the wood and, because it was in the country so sam i got to know sam and sam saw that that uh, that problem could happen so he was over there all the time bringing chicken wire and uh, and uh, medicines or whatever i might need he helped me again and again and again so when i did go out of birds i told him i want you to just take my birds nice and i gave them all to him yeah so pretty much ma maintaining a, a good environment for your pigeons keeping all the varmints out of there and and uh 
yeah. you know keeping up what about what about any strategy strategies um uh, that you did that that you employ to ensure your roller pigeons performance well during during the day of, of the show so i mean was there anything that that you did prior for them to 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 give to to give you that outstanding performance a good time fly time working together was there anything special that you did well again there was no show because all i did was invite friends over and uh but no no i didn't really get into that but as the birds progressed they got uh they would start spinning very fast. You could hear them at times in the air. And uh, and then they would start developing the depth. And they flew together. I got real good action. Had I competed, I probably would have done well. But, but I wasn't interested in competing. I was just interested in developing them. And, and to see how good I could get them and share with with others that were interested. Nice. And 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 um, you know what role does does the diet come in play as far as training and 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 performance of your roller pigeons? Well, that is a good question, and uh, that would de- that would depend really on on whether they just came from me or, or they'd been crossed to other, other families and stuff. And I'm sure, uh, I'm sure there's nobody out there that has a bunch of my birds except Sam Smitty. Yeah. And, 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 um, so what was, what was your, your, the diet that you use for the birds? I mean, what, what, what did you see? that worked best for you as far as you know the feed you know to to get the 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 maximum performance out of them i i didn't really get into that no okay. um, jerry i um the birds would start working as a team uh, pretty much naturally okay. because of the way i bred them uh, sometimes I would give them a little Milo and uh, um, Milo and uh, I forget at this point in time a tiny little snack before I would let them out sometimes but that was about it okay all right and um, <clears throat> did you find um, did you find a deeper birds to be uh, problematic for the competition or the show whatever the day of of your best performance but enjoy them um but enjoy them enough for your own employ uh enjoyment so did you see the the the, the deeper birds a problem for you i didn't i wasn't obsessed with depth but uh but all of the birds had decent depth they would all start uh, very shallow, but they all started working together. Uh, and and it wasn't something that happened overnight. It just took years and years of experimenting and trying different things. And and what it what equipment or tools do you use to track the performance and progress of your roller pigeons? Like if if is there anything that, like a log book, or how did you keep track of, of the performance so that your cultivation could go forward? Yeah, I didn't do that, Jerry. I just used my eyeballs, and uh, and I had uh, people come over to see them and and uh, and give them some of my birds. Right. I didn't do that. And and uh, when it came to to feeding the pigeons, were did, did you use a certain ratio or measurement or what w- what what you use as far as to know how much to give your your pigeons um, to 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 get get where you want it to be? 
with the pages. Yeah, I didn't really give them any special formulas, and uh, and even with the way I fed them, they did they did uh, pretty good. And uh, I'm sure if somebody would have taken them and experimented with that, uh, they could have got them to do a whole lot better. And maybe Sam would be a better one to talk to about that because Sam gets into that kind of stuff. Uh, to me, again, I just wanted, I wanted birds that were uh, excessive in speed nice. and, uh, and birds that worked together. And if some of them did not work with the team or they would fly out or whatever, uh, then I went back to the parents and I tried to figure out what I did wrong. Okay, nice. And the, the answer is always in the breeding law. All right, so, so, so our records were very important to you then? Yes, yes, very important. Nice, nice. And, and what, what, when it came down to the breeding loft, you know, what, what was too much for you to handle as far as pairs and, and, and for you to be able to evaluate what's, what's coming out for to be a flyer, what's breeding more breeders, you know, how, how, how did you come to, to determining what was a good amount for you to, to keep track of? Like how, how many pairs did you, would you normally work with? I didn't really work with any any certain amounts. I mean, I did have uh, <clears throat> I had my large birds to make breeders, and then I had the breeders to make kit birds, and uh, maybe I might have had fifteen, twenty pair, possibly something like that. But uh, it wasn't planned. It was just what I needed to fill up the kit cages and then see the results of what I had uh, done with my breeding. Nice. We got it. We have a question from uh, George Pena, and he says, uh, "Mr. Apodaca, do you breed strictly for performance, or do you also breed for co color balance?" I bred strictly, uh, strictly for performance. The color balance thing, um, I would, you, I used the red spangles. The red spangles were uh, recessive red, and uh, but I did not let the recessive red feathering get real, real soft. Okay, and I could control it better that way. Uh, the color balance thing, it's not really color balance, it's a feather balance, I would think. Uh, and uh, so if you use something with a soft feather on a hard feathered bird, uh, maybe you'll get more frequency. And I'm sure that's the goal and people try to get the birds to come in early. I did that. I did that with the grizzles. I it, I wasn't as effective, uh, just because I I saw years ago where a man and I don't remember his name. He was known, and uh, he bred so many grizzles in his family that all of his family eventually became grizzles. Because you made anything to a grizzle, you get grizzle. And even if the bird appears to be a self, you go under the tail uh, where the rump is into the quill feathers, you pull out a couple quill feathers and you'll see grizzling in the feathers. And, uh, and that, can, that can cause problems for you if you're not aware of it and know how to control it. Yeah, what, what, what will you consider uh, is, a, is a hard feather and versus a soft feather for those of us that you know have heard that term but haven't really uh, acknowledged what it is okay the the uh blue t patterns blue t patterns are hard feather and the ash red birds are hot 
uh, hard feather also. Okay. People will say blacks are hard feather, but blacks are almost, it's almost like a clear covering and what you make to a black determines what the color is going to be. But uh, uh, a black is not a hard feathered bird unless you have hard feather underneath it. Okay, and, and um, when, when you find the pairs that, that, that you, you have put together, paired up and, and bred out and, you know, and, and acknowledge that it's, 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 a, it's a proven pair, it's producing some great performers, it has all the traits you want to see in them, would you keep keep a click pair together or would you start testing it out in your loft with other pairs or splitting the splitting pairs and putting the cock with the other pair uh, other hand how, how how would you go by that would you always just keep a click pair together and then try to make another one or could you describe how, how what's the method you use for that if I had a pair that was producing good producers for me, then I would have more of a tendency to keep that pair together. But, uh, but birds that were producing kit birds, I would tend to experiment. Uh, I would spend, again, four to five hours in my loft, and I was always reevaluating matings. And I would say, what if I would have done this this way? And and then just taking notes over the results and figuring out how they would work best for the birds that I had at the time. Nice. So so pretty much that that's a lot of uh, uh, time putting it putting into to actually see what what birds are working for you what, what are the proven breeders um by proving the flyers since since the flyers won't go back into the breeder loft right right and once once in a while i would take a large cock and i would pick a hen out of the kit and uh and do that sometimes i would do that too but for as a rule, for the most part, I did not use the kit birds to breed with, because I spent a lot of time developing the breeders. Okay, and how do you feel about you know making a, an outcross or or do do you feel that it's best to work with let's just say one family of 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 birds? to cultivate from or is it do you feel that when you you're looking for your your muscle cock or muscle hen they just say you attend a, sh a show or go to a friend's uh, uh um loft and you see that that muscle cock or muscle hen are you able to bring that and just keep on going in in your program and, and still yeah. getting success, or would you need to keep that one family and look for those birds within the one family? No, I saw for years friends of mine that were just inbreeding, inbreeding, inbreeding. And, uh, and even though some people may say today that that works, it does work, but there's a time limit. And uh, people just can't keep doing that for many, many years. Uh, no, I was always experimenting. Uh, well, maybe I could have used that cockbird on this other hen. So then I would try it. Yeah, I would do stuff like that. And that's all just reevaluating my matings all the time. And I did it for me again. I didn't do it. Uh, I never tried to impress anybody. I just bred for myself. I was like the mad scientist. <laughs> and uh, if people came over and uh, wanted some birds, I would share with them. I did, didn't sell birds. I gave them. Nice. What was your, your best outcome as, or 
the best uh, birds you would produce as far as within your breeding program? Would it be uh, close related uh, cock and hen, or like, or would it be you know half brother, half sister, or did you bring in an outcross? What, what was one of your, the best um, matings you 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 have came across? What type of breeding program? When I would bring in a bird that I wanted to breed into my family, uh, I would do a 50-50 cross. I would use one of my cocks probably on the hen. And then uh, I would do 50-50 and I would do three-quarter cross. And and then I would just study the results. And, uh, and whatever I saw would lead me to make my next move. And sometimes I would just call the birds and say that didn't work, or it would give me another working family. But I never took all the families and made one. I always kept families separate. Nice. Um, Right now, you know, a lot of us are going through uh, our breeding season, and it's, it's the time to breed out the youngsters, and start flying them and you know in hopes that you know we got we got some good performers um how do you how do you introduce the the young birds in the air um i mean once you get your birds weaned from the from the parents um what what type of a, a fly program do you have for the young birds um do you fly them every day do you do, do you f- mob fly them all the youngsters in one mob fly do you make a, a, a team of youngsters so that they could get used to each other? What, what is your fly program for, for the young birds that you're starting to fly? Well, again, I didn't do competition, but I had about six kit cages, and I would fill them all up. Uh, and the young birds, I would just fly them. Uh, for whatever reason, I lived in the high desert, and uh, and so the birds all had good homing instinct. But I think it's because they could see where they came from, so I didn't usually have uh, problems where I would lose kits once in a blue moon. But uh, but I think a lot of times people fly in the city and the birds look down and everything looks the same. But that wasn't the case over there, so I had real good luck that way. How how long would you would you uh, start like how much, how long from the point you wean them from the parents? How long did you cage train them? Some people say that if you hold back on them too long, that that, that you kind of mess up their kidding ability. You kind of want to get them up in the air before the performance comes along. You don't want to keep them in too long. To where they get old enough, or where where they 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 start wanting to perform prior from kidding, what 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 do you how do you see that? No, I agree with that. I agree with that one hundred percent. And if I if I saw some birds that would fly away from the kit, then I figured that that was a breeding fault of mine, and. Uh, and some, sometimes I would bring in birds, and like I said, families had this creature that lurked within. They carried faults, but the, the previous breeder had bred these faults out so that they weren't happening at his house anymore or her. And, uh, but you cross them to other lines, and the faults that, that they bred out of their birds, they're still within them, and they come to plague you. Uh, and I don't know that that answered your question or not. Yeah, yeah. But but I did keep the youngsters uh, in, in a kit cage, and I would fly them out and pretty much leave them alone. Okay. And, and, and what, what, what do you, you say you had uh, kit, six kit cages for the youngsters, something like that. Yes. And and within those six cages, um, you're flying these young birds. Are you looking for 
a, a well, how would you say, it, a, a team that, that, that has the chemistry and it's, that has the breaking power, everything yes. you're looking for out of those kits? Yes. Yeah. So, yes. so at the end, at the end, what, how long would you give those birds to, 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 to show you that they got what they need? Well, I mean, and, and what, and for those that don't show you that, what, what comes from those birds? What do you do with those birds? Well, see, I had a, a different experience with my birds because again, I flew in the country. Uh, I didn't have a lot of predators. Sometimes they would show up, but in the city, there's a lot of predators. So you need fast development. I didn't worry about that, but, but uh, they would all start breaking together when they were very young. And, uh, and then they would start stretching out over a period of time. Okay, so 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 pretty much um, that you had early early developers and and um, yes, you know once they develop, you know matured a little bit, you start seeing you start seeing their 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 maximum potential. You you think? Yes, and and any faults that I saw within the kit uh, were within a small amount of birds and I would take that small amount of birds, put them in a show cage, start checking band numbers and then reevaluating the mating of the parents and uh, and thinking about how how the youngsters previously were coming out of those pairs or if they were new pairs, if they were new pairs and I didn't see them coming around like they should, uh, then I would break the matings or maybe even get rid of the parents completely. Nice. nice. So you're, you're pretty strict with, with, with the outcome. Would, would you say that you, uh, um, you know, gave, gave them chances to, to show you or would you just right away? Yeah. No, I wasn't. <laughs> when I met some of the, some of the people, uh, in the roller hobby at first, uh, and I won't mention any names. They had no tolerance. Uh, I saw, I saw some people take a whole kit full of birds and just kill them all at the same time. Well, I was never like that. I would give them a, give them a chance, you know, to prove uh, themselves. What, what would you uh, say the chance is? Uh... Um, they all, getting them into the they, next fly season, or how, well, how much chance would you give them? No, well, again, I didn't, you know, I wasn't really flying competition, but uh, I didn't want to wait five or six months for a kit to come in. Okay. So at an early age, they all started spinning together, and if some of them didn't, then to me that was a fault. What, what would you, from what you're feeding your birds, the ratio you're feeding the birds, um, the rest, the fly time, what's in, what's, what's a good amount of, of, uh, a fly time for, for a young bird? I mean, how, how long do you want to see them fly every day so that they could develop the, 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 the athletic in them as far as, you know, their, their, their their muscle their you know the way their body will develop i mean what, do they need to fly a certain time or did you keep them right at 20 minutes or do you like them to fly an hour or what, what was the ideal time for you well uh, like i said i i wasn't flying competition so i wasn't real concerned with that but uh Obviously, if they were up too long, then then they were just too flighty. But uh, I didn't put a whole lot of uh, thought in this stuff like that. I just wanted a good working team. I didn't want to wait months. And uh, 
and I wanted them to start spinning together <clears throat> when they were young. All right. And uh, did, did you see a certain fly pattern that you saw your birds um, trigger more of a break that, that you saw concern of? Like, let's just say a lot, lot of us like the figure eight pattern. Um, don't like it. Don't like the birds to fly on one wing. The birds, they just say flying too high versus too low. How how'd you like to see your birds? Um, I didn't want them to go uh, so high that I couldn't see what they were doing. Of course, I like them to uh, be at a height where I could uh, I could see the velocity and see if there were some that were not spinning together with the kit. Uh, I, I wanted to be able to identify those. Uh, so, so later, uh, as time went on, uh, whether or not they were going, going to come in, uh, and uh, then I would just make my determinations. Was there any techniques that you have as far as um, like let's just say your birds have been flying too high for you to be able to evaluate those birds were there any techniques to get them lower or were there any techniques to say that your birds were just too active and you needed to kind of calm them down a little bit and elevate them a little bit is there anything you did to get them higher slower I mean um a lot of us like the birds to be flying low and slow. Um, in any situation, could you could you give us an explanation? What will you do as far as if you needed to bring the birds down, if you needed to get the birds up, what, what, what would you do in, in a scenario like that? Well, we all trained the birds to a whistle, right? So that they would come down and that meant that they were going to get fed and I wasn't a great whisperer, but <laughs> but uh, no, not really, not really. I mean, uh, there was one time I raised a kit of solid blacks. I put them in the air. They were just youngsters, and they just flew away and never came back. And I saw no predator attacking them, and I always wondered why, and I could never figure that one out. But but mostly it was uh, individual birds. And uh, if I couldn't figure it out, I just discontinued the matings. Nice. But I wanted them all to come in, even if they were from different families, come in approximately at the same time. Okay. And, and right now is a season where a lot of us We'll start flying our birds, whether it's you want to enjoy them for yourself, whether it's competition. And it's the same thing when it comes down to enjoying them for yourself or competing. It, it, you want to see the best result from your birds. So right now is the time where a lot of, a lot of us have had our birds locked down because of the bird of prey. Um, is it too cold, snowing? whatever reason it is but we're 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 opening the cape box and starting to fly our pigeons um what what how did you deal with that as far as conditioning your birds getting them ready to start flying from a long lockout lockdown i mean a lot of times we witness the birds coming out and and too excited they have accidents they bump you got birds coming down, trying to land, they bump, and we need to get them to, to stability to where they're starting to work together and, and have control. Is, is there anything that you could share with us to where we could get our birds ready for the fly season? No, because again, I didn't, I wasn't a competitor. I just flew birds for me and, and that was it. So even 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 after a lockdown, you just keep on going like as the 
as for when you lock them down, the day you lock them down, I mean, the feed stays the same. A lot of times I would uh, want to give a kid of my birds to a friend or some somebody that had been coming over. And then I was anxious to start another kit and see if I got similar results. But no, I, I didn't do that. Okay. And and, and uh, did you ever practice uh, separating cocks and hens? Or you all, did you all, have you always been uh, flying uh, cocks and hens together? I flew them together. And the reason I did, again, because I wasn't competing. And I know that competition, uh, sometimes you'll have the, the hens that are attracted to the cocks or vice versa, and it causes problems. But no, I didn't, I didn't worry about that kind of stuff. Okay. My main thing was just developing a bird with high velocity. And that was always my goal. And 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 what what do you think would would have caused a, a team of birds to let's just say um, from having a a good uh, fly pattern one one day to to where the next time you fly them they're flying on one wing and the, you see you see you don't see much performance from them. What do you, what do you think is the problem that? that causes that you know well that may be a better question for for people that fly in the city than the country uh, again i didn't have many predators once in a blue moon and the uh, the birds could fly uh, uh and and not be bothered by stuff like that so uh those kind of thoughts just uh, just never really passed my mind. And what about when putting, trying to put a good kit together? I mean, uh, would you look for birds uh, rolling from the front, the back, the center? Did you ever look into that? My goal was was to uh, fly a kit where all birds were equal. And that's what I really worked hard at doing. But that was just a personal goal for me to fly uh, my birds at my house. And, uh, and again, just share with others. Yeah. Did, did, did you, um, you know, ever medicate your pigeons at all or, or use any type of vitamins or anything? I didn't use uh, vitamins, but uh, again, I lived in the country and we had these big rats up in Apple Valley up in the hills. I lived just below Big Bear and uh, Sam Smitty would come over he, uh, with medicine if I needed it uh, or wire to help keep some of the varmints out. and. Uh, Sam goes around and helps a lot of people. It turns out, yeah, he's a he's a really good person. Yeah, he's gonna be uh, coming out here for for a long show here in in, in a few mu- in a few weeks. Um, and and you're invited to come too. You're you're just right next door, right, Las Vegas? Yeah, yeah. Las Vegas. Yeah, so you're welcome to come and and hang out and. Uh, you know, hang out with the bird man, you know, roller man, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, I go sometimes to the to the Las Vegas flies. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And I have fun doing that, but right after, you know, I'm within an hour and a half or so from home. Uh, I'm getting to where I don't really drive anymore because I don't have the good peripheral vision I okay. used to have. How, how how old are you? You don't mind me asking. I'm going to be 80 in July. Oh, nice. So so, how long have you been without the pigeons? Probably six months, maybe. Oh, is that right? No, no, no. It's been longer than that. Uh, because we've lived up here a year and a half, so 
probably two years or close to that. Oh man, I bet you go out there and on the back and look around, oh, wishing I'm, you had pigeons, huh? But yeah, I was into uh, genetic projects, uh, uh, and uh, more so in other breeds, but. Out here in Las Vegas, you go into a parking lot, and there might be a hundred pigeons uh, sitting there. And I'll tell my wife, that's a, that's a bronze kite, and that one's a bronze <laughs> yeah. And, and <laughs> yeah. So, so, so you went, what, how many years you went with the pigeons? You, you're breeding? From the early 70s wow. uh, till, till, you know, like I said, about a year and a half ago. Wow. Two years yeah, long time, long yeah. time. And, uh, but, and with my music, it was the same because to me, if with the birds, the first questions I asked was, how do you identify a good bird? And somebody told me if they have white slits, uh, next to their eyes, they're a good breeder. And I looked at my son and I thought, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. And uh, I just got different, different ideas from different people. And for the most part, a lot of the stuff didn't make sense. And, and uh, so I just went by gut feel. And, by by uh, curiosity, did you ever fly any of those uh, muscle cocks or muscle hands to see what, what what kind of performance they had? No, no, I did not. I was more interested in, in what they threw for me into my birds. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a I'm, you know I'm a true believer that that selecting from the air could deteriorate the the performance. I, I um, so I, I, I also I also like to select my pigeons. Of course, they ain't gonna make it on the uh, uh, on the selecting cage if they if they don't perform. But I mean, you gotta be careful because they they do have bad traits um, that you could see as far as health health wise um, that could deteriorate. I I feel that's my 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 theory. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, I'm not gonna take nothing from anybody too that 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 believes that selecting best to best is the way to go. You know. I know, I know, to each his own, and uh, what I did worked, and I got very high percentages, and uh, and that's not a bragging thing at all. I just put a lot of time in it, and, and uh, I wasn't working, you know, through the, uh, I got married in 96, and by 97-ish or so, I retired. And uh, and so all through the 2000, uh, from 2000 till the 20s, uh, I just was playing with the birds and and, uh, and again I just raised them for me and, uh, and and if they did what I would please me, I had some people that would come over and they would say, "You're not feeding your kit right." And I tell them, what do you mean? Well, you should feed them more uh, this and that. And, and I tell them, you realize you're looking at squeakers. Mm -hmm. They barely been in the air. Yeah, but you know, they would be performing. <laughs> yeah. People, people have just got the strangest mindsets. But <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, man. Uh, uh, it's, that's, that's the type of retirement I want, you know? <laughs> you, you know? <laughs> I want 20 years after I retire to be flying pigeons, you know, and, and, and I'm pretty sure that's all, all, our, all of our dreams, you know. I just, it's very hard to, to maintain a, 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 good, um, a good loft, you know, and, 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 and you know, that's, that's saying their, their housing, their training, their, their the, the, the cultivation. It's just, it's hard to do when, when you got a nine to five and, and, and and along with that, you have, you have, you know, other duties or, or you know, uh, things you have to do besides the pigeons, you know. So it's, it's very hard, and I can't wait till I could just dedicate my time, 
to my pigeons all you know 100 <laughs> percent hopefully you can you know it's a, it's a it's a well life goes by so fast though i was going to say it's probably a lot of years down the road before you retire but you blink yeah. twice and you're there yeah yeah and you know it just i mean you know for the love of the pigeon you know we're we're out there versus um uh, you know, being on the couch watching TV or movies all the time, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and I could see where your enjoyment for this hobby has been to where you, you've have the time to experiment and apply these, these things and, and getting results, you know, and, and that's the main thing, you know, um, if you don't apply certain things, you never know, you're just guessing or you're going by what someone else is saying, and that somebody else could live in the other side of the world and, and, and thinking that it's going to work for you. And when it doesn't, you just, just you give up too easy. You know what I'm saying? So um, that's that's awesome that you're able to come up here and say that you have practiced something and you have and, and you have experienced the, you know, the outcome, you know, whether good or bad, but you did it, you know. Yeah, and beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. No matter how good they are, there will always be people that say they're garbage. Uh, but the main thing is that you're satisfied with with whatever you have. Yeah, yeah. Is there is there anybody you you please rec and, and, and you could recommend any anyone who. Who can that you could think of that you respect and might like to hear interviewed on, on this podcast? Is there somebody that you would like to, you know, hear him out? Somebody that you look, like I said, respect. Somebody where I would want to hear. Yeah. You interviewed them. Yeah. Um, not really. Not really, because. Um, I don't know. You know, people people that I know and respect. I've been to their house, and and I know what they've got. And and uh, if I was able to improve their birds with some of mine, I would help them. Or if I saw something that could help me, uh, they would help me. But uh, no. Um, you know, before before we end the show. Um, is there any word of advice that you would like to, to give to somebody that either has been in a hobby and trying to show progress in their in their in their in their pigeons or someone coming into the hobby um, as a newbie? Is there some word uh, word of advice that you could tell them? I would say. Uh talk to different people before you start a hobby like this and you're going to find that uh, maybe six diff- six people will tell you six different ways to go uh, and uh, it's hard to really get going on the right foot uh, but as you start mating your birds together Get them from known breeders, and uh, and just uh, just study what they're doing, what the results are, and always try to figure out uh, why the negatives pop out. It's it's not it's not easy because you can talk to five people and get five different methods. Well, and if I can ever help anybody, put them in touch with me. I, do, sure. I would be glad to. And not that I did anything great. I I pleased myself, and that's what I wanted to do. Well, you know what? Um, I I, I necessarily don't. I I don't think that one's got to compete and 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 win anything to be be a great. Uh, uh, roller legend you know um, we all put in the time in the effort to cultivate um, better Birmingham rollers and and that is the way that 
that we could look ourselves as being a, a, a big part of this hobby because when you do that, you come across many, many people, meeting new people, um, sharing your birds with people, and you're not giving people junk birds, you know, because because you've put in that time to 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 cultivate the true Birmingham rollers and 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 keep keep that hobby going strong. So, you know, I give you lots of credit and 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 I look at you as as you know one of the legends in this hobby and and I appreciate everything you've done and I, I highly respect that. Can I say one more thing, please? Yes. Uh, one time I had a group of guys over at my house and I wasn't flying birds. We were just talking birds, going in the loft and stuff. And this one gentleman said, uh, I haven't been able to get any birds from anybody, any good birds. I pay high money and they're, they're no good. And so I called Sam. I said, Sam, come over here. And Sam walked over and I said, uh, we need to help this guy. And I told him, I said, I'll give you some uh, decent birds and Sam will too and we'll get you going. And he chose not to because he thought if people give me free birds, they'll be trash. See? And, uh, but I love people. Yeah. And, and I think that that's within Sam too. Right, right. So it does, you know, you know, you can sometimes uh, help is is very close. You know, you just uh, yeah. you have to accept it when it's offered. Yeah, of course. And and that, that goes for those of us that are are looking for for some help with some good pigeons. You know, I mean, you know, whether you pay for them, dig into your pockets, and pay good money, or you 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 get you get blessed with them you know put in your work you know take it serious you know don't don't get this man's birds here and decide not to go with them because of whatever reason i mean i mean you know we we, we put in a lot of time in these pigeons you know what i'm saying they're not to get handed down or sold so that you could say those birds didn't do nothing for you man you know what i mean you got to put in that time you got to put in that work you know what i mean you know, you know, you might be tired and sleepy, but you know what, man, get out there and and and, and you know, <laughs> look, look at what you got going on. You know, how could you make it better? You know what I'm saying? So, we all need to put put our work into it, and and uh, you know, but but like I said, you know, I highly appreciate you know you and people like you that that has been putting the work and helping everybody out. You know that that's what this hobby is all about. You know, I mean, friendship too. You know. Um, thank you. Yeah, and 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 I want to say thank you for those of you that that are that are viewing right now and and that are helping out and supporting. Um, just keep the support up; it's very important. You know, um, there's a lot to 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 do within this hobby to you know keep it going better. And 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 I want to work with people that are willing to to help me out and 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 do what I'm doing and maybe we could get start getting people like Richard right here, you know, reaching out to us and, and, and participating to and we, this hobby needs it. You know what I'm saying? So Richard, thank you so much. Thank you, brother. And, and it's been a great podcast. Stay tuned for the next 